All right, welcome to Spine Conference. Let's get started here. Can you see it? Great. You want, you want to turn off the uh, lights? Uh, I think it's here. Hold on. You get it? Is that okay? You're going to fall asleep? Yeah. Huh? Okay. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I know. All right. Welcome to Spine Conference. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So this is a 70 year old man. It's not actually him, but somebody else has left sciatica and his history is he said sciatica for 10 weeks, no right side symptoms, all left sciatica, 10 weeks. So two and a half months, the pain is localized in the left hip, left buttocks, left posterior lateral leg, left lateral malleolus. Can anybody um, guess what nerve root goes to the lateral malleolus outside lateral ankle? I know Madeline knows. Okay, I'll get multiple choice. L4. L4 typically goes to the um, lateral thigh and to the knee. That's what they say. L5 goes to the lateral malleolus, dorsum of the foot. S1 goes posterior heel, calf, posterior heel, lateral border, uh, lateral border of the foot, maybe plantar foot. So it's L5 dermatome distribution. And physical therapy didn't help. And he, he has many medical problems. So... Um, What's a comment on the x-rays? AP lateral, somebody. Uh, okay, so the x-rays show on the front view, no scoliosis, uh, some, um, some osteophyte formation here. On the lateral view, I mean, is he, do you think he's standing pitch forwards or, or, or uh, is he standing straight or forwards? Yeah, definitely forwards, right? And... Um, why is that? Can you just give a guess? He's got left sciatica. It feels better. Yeah, it feels better when you extend, when you flex, it opens up the spinal canal just a bit. And the nerve roots are small. So it just takes a little, just a little bit of flexion makes a big, very big difference. And flexion extension views show no instability, which is important. And here's an ossified here uh, at L5. So there's no spondylolisthesis. So structurally, the spine is... Hey, Dr. Sam. good morning. How are you? Great. Structurally, the spine is, uh, is normal. So who wants to comment on the MRI? Anybody? Come on. You guys. Yeah. 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 Right here. Right? Right here. Yeah. It's not normal. So the squares are the vertebral bodies and the discs are in between the spinal canals posterior. And you can see here, there's a really large disc herniation, isn't it? And something looks unusual here. And this is the T2 weighted images because the CSF is bright. This is the fat suppression. See how the fat is very dark. These don't help you in this case. And then now a, a typical MRI scan, this is an axial cut of an MRI scan. You can see the spinal canal and inside the spinal canal, you can see the nerve roots. And if this is the L4, L5 disc, this would be the five root as it traverses that segment. And then the four roots right here. And this is the foramen. This is the central spinal canal. This is the thecal sac. And so if this is L5, this is, S, this is uh, S1, this is S2, these are S2, S3, S4, S5. And those sacral nerve roots do what in the body? The S2, are they important? S2, S3, S4, S5, sacral nerve roots, what do, you, what do they do? M motor function, sensory. Per perineum and bowel and bladder control. So they're very, they're, they're not important if they're, if they're working, but if they're not working, it's a serious problem. So if you can see, you have to have a really big disc herniation to compress these nerve roots in the middle. And this is a very nice MRI. So here's our patient's MRI, and it's not so nice. Um, and why, Why? can anybody guess why some MRIs are excellent? Like, see this one? You, can't, you can hardly see the nerve roots, and it's blurry. Yeah, that's one thing. And why do patients move? There's two reasons why they move. They're in terrible pain, and you ask them to go into a torpedo tube. And then, and the other thing is some people, some people with no pain, if you go into a torpedo tube, they don't like it either. Why is that? Well, 
claustrophobia. Yeah, people have claustrophobia. So uh, and, and so you put them in a torpedo tube and they have anxiety because like, oh, my God, I have something wrong with me and they just can't stand it. So they move. <laughs> uh, other reasons are it could be an open magnet, which doesn't give you as good resolution. And also the patient's size. If you have a really big person, the, the picture is not as good. And then the other thing is it, it could be an old MRI scanner so, or, or old software. Um, and uh, uh, not every MRI scan is state of the art uh, um, technically. And also the software is not state of the art. So sometimes they're just not good. And unfortunately, as a clin clinician, we have to just accept it. I mean, sometimes we put a foot down. And uh, I mean, you guys, work, you guys work in the office, you put your foot down and say, I need another MRI. It's a big problem because Aetna's not going to pay for it. Or, and, and then you have, to, you have to justify it. So, oh, and this guy. So this is, uh, this is our patient. This is L5S1. You see the spinal canal? You see that you can barely see the nerve roots. The nerve roots here. Nothing's going on. The spinal nerve roots look great. But then at 4-5, what's going on here? What's that? Yeah, it's a really big disc herniation. And you cannot see the nerve roots at all. See this? Oops. See the spinal canal? You can't see the nerve roots at all. And the nerves are severely compressed. It's a big one. So if this, if this whole thing is the spinal canal, what percentage of the spinal canal do you think is taken up by this big disc herniation? Just guess. Yeah, a lot, right? Three quarters. And the sacral nerve roots could be affected by this, right? You can see them in the middle. Remember we, sh remember we showed them here? And they see they're in the center. They could easily be affected by a, a disc herniation this size. So when this patient came in the emergency room and was admitted, um, they sent him to physical therapy and injections and rehab. And um, I mean, for a big disc herniation like this, it's probably not going to work. But any, any questions so far? Okay, so let's let's go into the history. The history, I think, is critical in lumbar disc herniation. So I feel like if people are getting better, I'm more likely to non -op, to treat the patient non-operatively. If the patient's getting worse, more likely uh, uh, to treat uh, operatively. And also the time frame is like a week versus six weeks. This guy's ten weeks. So straight a straight leg raise when you lay the patient flat and you pull them up, it pulls on the nerve, and the nerve is trapped at the spine and it hurts. So when you move the legs, um, uh, it's a sign of nerve root tension sign. So the non-operative treatments are steroids, non-steroidals, muscle relaxers, opiates, neuroleptics, physical therapy, chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, injections. These are all the different options. I think the one that's uh, my go-to is a, a steroid pack uh, and, uh, and then followed by a strong uh, non-steroidal and a muscle relaxer to break a pain cycle. So... I think breaking a pain cycle in these patients is very important, and sometimes they can go on to heal themselves. So um, I, just want to, I just want to go over the spine for you guys. That's the, 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 the units of the spine are like a cube. So there's a cube. That's one uh, spinal unit. You stack them all together in a column. That's the spine. And then at every level, a nerve comes out. The nerves run down the legs. So you can see that's the uh, lumbar uh, nerves. And that nerve is called the sciatic. When it hurts, it's called sciatica. And it's extremely painful. If anybody's had sciatica, it's not something you can live with. So the, this is a normal vertebral body. And the nerves live within the spinal canal and exit the foramen. And then exit uh, in the anterior portion of the abdomen through the psoas. So I'm just telling you this because this is relevant to the case. So the spine moves in, in different planes, flexion, extension, bending, and rotation. And some people are more flexible than others. This is like a, a student at GW like 20 years ago when I was there. I used to cover the team. You can imagine the amount of extension there, but almost everybody loses this as they get older. They get, they get stiff and arthritic. The disc is made up of, you could say, two portions. The outer portion, which is very strong uh, and uh, cartilaginous, and the inner portion, uh, which is hydrophilic. And then it's a continuum. To, uh, it's not like one and zero. It's a continuum to the outer portion. The outer portion of the disc is extremely innervated. The inner portion is not. And that's why when you have a disc, when you have a disc tear, the MRI is normal, but the patient can't move. Why is that? Because it's innervated. So it's, it's, it's richly innervated. It's really painful. And patients can't understand that they don't have an emergency because they can't move. And you tell them that they get very upset. Uh, so this is basically a rabbit disc, and they and they stain the uh, pain fibers. You can see, so it's it's the annulus is richly innervated. So this is this is my 
my uh, rendition of how do disc herniations heal. So if you if you had a disc herniation, you go to your primary care physician and say I have sciatica, do they send you immediately to the surgeon? Never, right? Because the surgeon is going to do unnecessary surgery usually because surgeons are surgeons. They do, they're like, you know, they can't have to help themselves. They're like snakes. But they do heal. The sciaticas do heal. And and, and, and it's, it happens all the time. And I've seen it on MRI scan. Very large disc herniations. One year later, that thing's gone. And the other thing that I've, I've done is I do it. I, I schedule a, a surgery, a uh, patient for surgery. We can't get into the surgery for six weeks or so because of different reasons, non-operative treatments. When we get in the case, disc is gone. And um, <clears throat> when this first happened to me, it was very disconcerting because I thought I was at the wrong level. But this is, this is why I think discs heal by themselves. So if you can cut somebody in half, okay, axial load, there's the, there's the disc, there's the spinal canal. We're going to make that bigger. So again, the disc, and you see all the nerve roots. So if you have a disc herniation, and it can herniate anywhere. It can herniate anterior. What happens if you herniate a disc anteriorly? What does the patient feel? Anybody guess? Huh? Well, they have some pain, but it's central axial back pain, not nerve pain, because there's no nerves there. But it hurts, and, and it heals, and they're fine. So on here, same thing. The, the back pain, it heals, it resorbs, they're fine. But if it herniates posterior laterally, it compresses the nerve roots, and it gives you very bad sciatica pain. Makes sense, right? So what happens when you have a disc herniation? It exudes uh, um, factors uh, from the nucleus pulposus, and then you get vasculogenesis. The, the blood vessels grow into it, and that's on, that's the uh, explanation on the right. Um, the, you, you get vascularization of the disc herniation, and then through the uh, vasculature, macrophages uh, come out of the of the blood vessels and basically go into the disc and eat the disc like it's a bacteria. And slowly, slowly over time, it's gone. Uh, and this is a, I sent you guys this article of uh, basically all the, in unbelievable detail, all the, the science behind this. I, I barely read it too, but. She tried huh? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I told you it's super, super boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> So just basically, the, there's phagocytosis, the, we, and that's how, we, uh, that's how we heal these things. And this is from the article, all the factors involved. So when this goes, success, right? The disc is gone, uh, non-operatively. So who gets credit for this success? In, in, in the, I mean, who gets the credit for the resolution? Is it like rest? Is it traction? Is it uh, physical therapy, chiropractic, massage, the physical therapist, acupuncture? An injection by the pain management doctor, the doctor himself, the surgeon. Is it does God get the credit? So who gets the credit? It's just time. Yeah, it's just so we heal ourselves. So all this is like a huge complex that we have for disc herniate for a spine. But basically, I tell patients, let's give you some time. And then the patient's like, I can't take this. I'm dying. I said, okay, well, then, and then that's when you do all the other things, physical therapy, medications, injections. Just give yourself more time. So um, most disc herniations are posterior lateral, like just like this one. It's a typical one we see right now. <coughs> and the reason is it's a general area of weakness because the direct central uh, is the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is really strong. But then there's a, there's a relative area of weakness where most disc herniations occur. Um, I won't get into this. This is just a nomenclature. I won't get into this. This is another article on nomenclature that I, I pulled up some time ago. And um, discs can be broad-based. They can be focal. They can just protrude or they can extrude if it's like the, the diameter is smaller than what you see in the spinal canal. And they can be sequestered. I don't have that one when it's just free in the spinal canal. And then as a, as a spine surgeon, there's all different areas, all different nerve roots that uh, a disc herniation can compress centrally, subarticular by the facet, in the foramen, and outside of the foramen. Uh, and the foramen is particularly uh, sensitive. I'll go over that. And this is just a typical disc herniation posterior lateral. And if you pull, if you pull on the patient's leg or move the leg, the nerve moves and it's it's up against this disc herniation and it hurts. And then you can imagine if you pull the opposite leg, if it's a very big disc herniation, you pull the opposite leg. The nerve on the other side moves, and, but the, that nerve is connected to the spinal cord at L1, so the whole thing sort of moves, and that's why a contralateral 
uh, straight leg rake can hurt because the whole thing sort of moves together a little bit if it's a big disc herniation. So the frame is exquisitely painful um, between the two pedicles. And the reason is it's the dorsal root ganglion. You can see the dorsal root ganglion right here. Yes. It's, on the exam, when you're doing that contralateral leg raise, can they appreciate that the pain is still on the other side? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you pull on the opposite leg and, and it makes and it like... Else, if you lift your right leg, you'll look all the way left. The left hurts. Okay. That tells you it's a big disc herniation right. or it's very sensitive. So the dorsal root ganglion um, uh, is where the nerves uh, connect, basically. And uh, there's a lot of pain fibers there and it's exquisitely tender. It's very, very painful. Uh, I won't get into that. So here's like a, a, a 15 year old disc. You can see the hydrophilic middle and the outer portion. And this is like a 50 year old disc loss of hydration and the annulus tears. Risk factors are uh, for degenerative disc disease, uh, hyperlipidemia, obesity, hypertension, um, laborers, age, genetic, cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is an independent predictor for degenerative disc disease. But you, saw that, you tell that to patients, they don't believe you. They're like, everybody, every doctor tells me to stop smoking. I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> and teenagers grow. Teenagers grow in their spine in the apophysis. You see the dark areas? That's where teenagers grow in the spine. And they keep growing until they're about 21. Well, our girls stop about 16, 17. Boys stop around 21 to 23. And um, this is kind of boring, but th this is a normal disc grade one. And you can see this is a bone on bone disc and the disc deteriorates over time. You can see like a natural history of disc degeneration. Uh, I won't get into that. So, I mean, I, I won't get into this study because I didn't send it to you guys, but it was from 2020 surgery versus conservative care. I, I think, I think if patients, Patients do better with surgery if they fail non-operative treatment and time. So I think they basically, they present themselves. You give the option. I, I never tell patients to have surgery. I give them my opinion, but I never make the final decision. I just say, look, this is an option. It, it's, it's more aggressive. It gets you better faster. You do take risks with it. So you can, it's kind of like a trade-off. No risks with conservative care. It takes longer, may not work. The surgery... It works, it's faster, but you do take some risks, infection, and you may weaken the disc itself from like pulling on it, and, like taking pieces out of it. So it's a trade-off. So any questions about so far? Okay, we'll keep moving. So where am I going with this? This oh, this is how to do a disc disc surgery. So patient's prone, small incision. So this is where the spine is. You see the spine is processed, the lamina of the set, and this is. This is where the disc is there. So this is in my mind. I know this is where I got to go. And, um, so this is usually where the disc herniation, remember posterior lateral. So how are we going to get there? This is, this is the laminotomy I make. And you see this many times, right, Madeline? This is like, I, I kind of square it out so I can get there. And the reason why I make it, this is why I make it uh, round. Um, this is the first airliner that ever flew um, and in 1952. And I think the first three crashed and they didn't know why these airplanes were crashing. And when they pulled all the pieces together, the windows were square. They found out that the square window was a stress riser and the planes broke apart at the square window. It's a stress riser. So I think the same thing in the spine. I don't make a stress riser. I make it nice round so it doesn't crack because if it cracks, it goes right into the pars and you get a pars fracture. So um, it's just it's just the uh, geometry of stress risers. So that's why in the airplane all the all the windows are uh, oval. Okay, so we get the burr and we we do our oval opening, thin it down, and then I use a keratin punch to remove the last bit of bone. And this is this is my rendition of how you do this. You have the bone and then you have the nerves. Nerves are very delicate; you don't want to injure them. The bone is very hard; it's like a rock. So how do you do this? You take the burr and you thin it down. You thin the bone, then bone, 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 bone. And then you get to be paper thin. And then sometimes I actually go through. Like, Madeline, remember yesterday I was like, oops, I'm, I'm through here. And I can tell because I'm under the microscope and I'm 10 times uh, magnified. And you can, I mean, it's, just, it's very subtle, but it's obvious because it's soft. Um, and you have to be very careful. Uh, so you get it super thin. And then once you get it very thin, almost to the nerve roots, you just basically pick it away slowly uh, with a curette. And that way you don't injure the nerves. 
But once you have the opening, you're looking at the fecal sac, the nerve roots, you see the black things, the disc herniation. You basically have to remove it. You have to remove it. And the other thing I do, Madeline, is I make my cut as close to the lateral border of the fecal sac as I can. I don't want too much room because the, the, big, the more room there, the higher the stress riser to fracture. So I want it just flush with the fecal sac because I don't, I don't, I don't want it to be too, I, has, I have to see the edge of the fecal sac, I think, because I don't like retracting the nerve roots. So you may say, you know, why don't you retract the nerve roots? You, you should be able to. I feel it increases the probability of a nerve injury. And once the nerves are injured, they may not recover. So that's why I think a lot of spine patients have uh, intractable radiculopathy type symptoms or the radiculopathy symptoms stay for a long time because of excessive retraction. And there's no way you can prove that by an MRI or anything. It's just a surgeon. I think you have to be very careful. So you just expose the disc and you remove it. And the nerve is still inflamed over time, but it usually goes better. <laughs> any, any questions about the disc surgery? Okay. So the, the surgery is prone. I usually use a Jackson table a C arm to prove where I am. I feel the microscope. I love the microscope because I can see better and there's this beautiful light. And this is us, this is the, during the surgery and the assistant can see too. That's what's so good about the microscope. So obviously we use a scalpel, a bovie. I don't use the tube. I use a, I like to use a tailor because it's easier. I use a plax, plastic suction because it's soft and doesn't, it won't injure the nerve roots like a, um, like a Fraser, uh, and in the lumbar spine, you can manipulate nerve roots in the cer in cervical. You cannot. So that's why I use the plastic in the lumbar. And then we use a, a, a high speed drill. That's a high speed drill. And his burrs, it's almost the same as our burrs. Here's our burr and here's a, our high speed burr. And this is the kerosene punch, which lifts the bone. And we use Penfield. This is a uh, Penfield. He was a Canadian neurosurgeon. We use Penfields uh, for manipulation of nerve roots. That's a, I think a two, that's a three, it's got a curve to it. That's the one, remember the scoop that we used? That's a four on the bottom uh, and, and curettes of different sizes and pituitaries, which are used to remove uh, uh, the pituitary, but because it goes through the nose, but it's great for disc surgery too. So we'll go back to our guy. So our guy's 10 weeks and he's not getting better. He can't walk. So what should we do? Send him to more physical therapy or? Injections, he can't walk. He's terrible. He says he's not getting better. Yeah, I offer surgery because he's not getting better. Um, and it's failed. And it's, it's, I think it's enough. I mean, six weeks, you should be feeling better by then. So here's our case, same guy. Um, we have to prove the level with a clamp intraoperatively. And then once we get to the disc space, it's, I think it's optimal to prove where you are with the Penfield 4 within the disc space because you can very easily be fooled where you are because the incision is small. So that's why I do that. So let's look at the surgery. Oops. Give me a second, guys. And just to ask questions. So this is the intraop, same patient. On the left is his head. Huh? Oh, shoot. Hmm. What happened here? What is, do you know what the computer is called? It's laptop one up there. Mm, uh oh, we're in trouble. <coughs> hmm. I don't know what to do. Um, we can watch it on my screen. Sorry, guys. Not this one. Where is it? This one. So, good that I brought the big one. So, the, the patient's head is over here. This is the sir, This is lateral. This is the midline on the top. This, his uh, feet are to the right. And here's our 
here's our hole, which is ellipse, and the, th the nerve roots are exposed, and the kerosene is used to remove uh, the bone material and ligamentum flavum. And you want to, and I drilled the drill again, you thin it down so that you can remove bone. And the curette, remember we said the curette lifts things away from the, basically when you work around nerve roots, you're always lifting things away from them. You don't go towards them, you lift away. So the pituitary grabs it and then with the curette and the kerosene, I'm gently moving, that's ligamentum flavum. That's on the uh, fecal sac. It's just more of the same. And there's always some, usually some fat in the epidural space. See the fats coming up? And it's, uh, it, it, this, it's under some pressure because of the size of the disc herniation. That why, that's why the fat is coming out towards you. So it's basically a slow process of just, now that's the dura right there. And so you, when you see the dura, it's, you know, it's helpful, you know where it is, and you're just gently removing ligamentum flavum and exposing the dura. And then, see, I, I, need, I need just a little bit more room. That's why I'm removing lateral to the fecal sac. And then this is with the pen field, I'm sweeping. I'm always, always sweeping over the nerves to make sure there's no attachments because naturally there are attachments uh, to the ligamentum flavum and the bone from the dura. And if you don't sweep those away, you'll pull in the dura and cause a dural tear. So that's why I'm constantly sweeping during the case to make sure there's no attachments. And here I, I need more room to look at the disc space. I'm removing the lateral ligamentum flavum off the dural, and this is the dural here. And see how I use the suction to uh, manipulate the nerve roots? So since the suction tip is uh, soft and plastic, it's a very nice instrument to you know manipulate, and it sucks at the same time, so it's, it's very helpful. Let's see, where are we here? What does this say? So then, I, so these patties are, are basically pushing the dura, pushing the nerve roots medial to expose the disc space. So they, the, the patties sort of act as a retractor. And um, I, I don't like my assistant. So I'm, I'm trying to pull out the disc. I don't like my assistant pulling on the uh, dura because they have a hard time feeling. And see, there's the disc fragment that comes out. So it's a huge piece, yeah. That's basically the case. So it's, I mean, a little bit I don't trust my assistant because the assistant, it's, it's hard for the assistant to gauge and they get tired. So why take a risk with that? So that's why I pack things off with um, a patty. And also the patty stops bleeding. So that's, ba that's basically the case. That was a huge fragment and then it came out, in this case, it came out in one piece, but then there's a nerve root, and I used the nerve hook to tease away the disc uh, and see, make sure there's no other free fragments. And um, that's basically it. So, any questions on lumbar discectomy? Let me put you back on. Anybody? What about the stuff? Quickly, do you expect some people to see relief of symptoms? Yeah, so um, relief of symptoms. So it's basically, usually it's, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. So immediate, patients have immediate uh, improvement in their sciatica symptoms. But I, I describe the patients as a bouncing ball. So I, I feel it helps them understand it. Like, so that when the ball is high in your hand, there's a lot of pain. It goes down to the ground zero, but then it just bounces uh, up and down a bit over the course of a month until it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes, but it's it, 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 in little like cycles like that, and then it's gone for the nerve to have total resolution of its symptoms. But usually there should be a big difference. Right. There should be like, the patient should say, it's gone. Not always. And in fact, some patients say it's worse. 
So the next step is, okay, I manipulated it, and that's why it hurts more. We'll give them steroids, and hopefully that resolves it. But if the patient has no symptoms whatsoever, you have to wonder, did I get it out? I mean, maybe I was at the wrong level. It's, it's hard to say. Okay, let, let me call you back. Yeah, let me call you back. So what other questions do you have? Anybody? That's my brother. <laughs> About disc herniations or surgery or who gets surgery and the surgery itself. We all good? Okay. This patient probably went home, right? What's that? They went home, right? 